very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ming Kuot Lim. I am the advisor for communications and information for UNESCO's office based in Jakarta. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be um, working together with AIBD on the AMS 16 uh, for this 2019 year. All of us here today, including journalists, editors, producers, regulators, representatives from ministries, are challenged by the issue of disinformation. Uh, traditional news have already been suffering from decreased revenues, uh, losing out to internet giants such as Google and Facebook. There's a reduction in human resource itself, namely the investigative journalist side of things. And at the same time, newsrooms are being compelled and asked and demanded to work as fast as ever, even faster, with limited resources. And today, even the issue of trust and credibility of newsrooms are being questioned and constantly under threat. There is a report out today from Reuters, just today it came out, that says that trust in media across 38 countries that you survey had dropped again 2% to 42%. So it's been dropping for a while now. And one of these threats is fake news, which the term itself is problematic. Because as we know, if something is fake, it cannot be news. And if something is news, by definition, it cannot be fake. So that term itself is quite problematic. The role of social media and social media platform cannot be excluded from our discussion today. One study that has been mentioned this morning from MIT note that false information spread six times faster than real stories on social media platforms. That is certainly something that we should consider. And internet companies such as Facebook, including its subsidiaries, the Instagram and WhatsApp, accounts for 80% of social media usage in Asia. That is huge, 80%. And YouTube also is under a lot of pressure for allowing or using an algorithm that recommends users for increasingly violent and extreme content. So that is yet another issue. But to their credit, social media companies are doing something about it, tweaking and changing their guidelines and their policy and their algorithms. Governments around the world are also doing something, including enacting legislations the so-called anti-fake news law. But whether these laws are effective or not, we are not entirely sure yet. Unfortunately, in most circumstances, these kind of laws may actually be more restrictive to freedom of expression than helping the issue or solving the underlying problems. Therefore, we are very fortunate today that we have a variety of speakers <laughs> representing different perspectives who can help us better understand the issue of disinformation. We have Dr. Masato Kajimoto from University of Hong Kong, who will be talking about the issue of thr trust in the media. Next, we'll have Mr. John Neri from the Philippines, who will be connecting the issue of disinformation with access to information. Our third speaker, Ms. John Navi, is from the Ministry of Information of Cambodia, who will be discussing the issue with examples from this country. Next, we have Mr. Roland Houston, who is with the French Embassy based in Malaysia, who will be giving us some examples of the French and the European experience in dealing with this issue. Finally, to round things off, we have Ms. Anne Kruger from uh, the first draft uh, news based in Sydney, Australia, who will be giving us some examples from Australia and as well as New Zealand. Each speaker will have 10 minutes to give their personal presentation. And after all the speakers have finished their presentation, we will gather back on the stage for a round of Q&A, question and answers with the audience. I would like to remind all speakers that you have a time limit of 10 minutes and when the bell rings, please prepare to wrap it up 
So we have ample time to talk about the very interesting and complex issue of disinformation with members of the audience. And without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Masato Kajimoto. Please. Dr. Kajimoto is an assistant professor at the Journalism and Media Studies Centers at University of Hong Kong. He specializes in news literacy, education, misinformation, edu uh, ecosystem research in Asia, and he has been a leading researcher with media educators and journalists in the region to develop pedagogical methods. And before he started his career in teaching, he was also a reporter and a web producer for CNN International. The floor is yours, doctor. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. All right. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Masaru Kajimoto. I'm from HKU Journalism. Today, I want to talk about trust in media. Um, how many of you here are from the media industry? How many of you are working journalists? Can you raise your hands? Oh, okay, not as many as I wished. How many of you say the trust in your media organization has been on the decline compared with, let's say, five years ago, 10 years ago? How many of you say, yeah, my audience trusts us a bit less compared with five years ago, 10 years ago? Oh, okay, they're a very enthusiastic group of people right there. So, okay, and you too. So today, I want to talk about trust in media. This is a kind of topic that I talk at my university with my students. And normally, I take probably at least one lesson, which is three hours, sometimes two weeks, that's six hours. But I try to pack everything in 10 minutes. So if you could bear with me, uh, I will go through my slides really quickly. So the first question I want to raise today is this. Why should your audience trust you? Some of you actually raised your hands, right? Your audience are trusting you far less now compared with before. Why should they? If you put yourself into the shoes of a news audience, why should they trust you? That's the question you should be asking yourself, right? And these are the typical answers that I get from, okay, hmm? oh, there, <laughs> okay, uh, from the um, journalists, right? Well, we are committed to accuracy, right? Our report is accurate. We have an editorial process to make sure that the facts we are including in our news report is correct, therefore we should be trusted. Another reason we, are often, we often hear from journalists is this, well, we strive to be fair. We are all human beings, we cannot be 100% bias free, but we try to minimize right, uh, that bias within our news organizations. Our newsroom try to be not biased at all. Right? So that effort should count something. Another reason I hear quite often is this. We take responsibility for our content. We are not platforms like Facebook and Google. Right? They claim that, well, contents are generated by users. We are not responsible. Whereas in news organizations, if you report something, you take full responsibility. Certain governments could come after you, and you take that because it's your content. Right? Another reason. We are ethically conscious. We think about consequences. We don't just negatively attack somebody. If we do that, we compare that with, you know, good for the public, right? So we are ethically more conscious than those people who are creating fake stories. We have a track record of doing this for a long time. We've been in journalism industry for many years. We know what to do. We know how to do this. Therefore, we should be trusted. So if you pack everything up, this is the reason. We have journalistic integrity. Those people who are creating fake news stories do not have it. Therefore, we should be trusted. Unfortunately, trust doesn't work that way, right? Um, to understand how trust works, I think um, there are lots of different academic disciplines that you can look, uh, look into. But philosophy tells us this. Trust is actually built on dependence and risk. And again, I have no time to go into the details in 10 minutes, but just quickly, right? Um, your reason that you, the reason journalists often give that they should be trusted is a very rational thought, 
right? Rationally, yes. Your news report should be more trusted than fabricated news stories. But trust has also other reasons. For example, I trust my wife, right? 100%. <laughs> but I trust her not because what she tells me is always 100% accurate. I trust her because, you know, I love her. So it's an emotional trust that I'm placing on her. And trust has many other factors involved in it besides rational reasoning. And trust also means risk, right? If, for example, my good friend John asks me that, hey, Masato, I'm broke today. Can you give me 500 bucks? I would probably give him because I trust him that he would return it, right? But I'm also taking a risk. I may not see that 500 bucks in the future, right? So there's a risk involved. So philosophical understanding of trust is like this, and how does that relate to media industry? First, monopoly is over, right? That's one of the themes that we've heard many times today. Now, audience has so many more choices to go to, to get news. In other words, their dependence on the news organization is far less compared with five years ago, 10 years ago. Naturally, they trust you less. And Reuters Institute at Oxford University released a report today, which sort of confirms this idea that, well, trust comes with dependence. For the audience to understand how great your journalism is, how quality news reporting you are producing, they have to be extremely savvy about news by themselves. In other words, you are expecting really high level of news literacy among the audience. And unfortunately, that's not the situation right now, especially in many Asian countries. And that's the reason why I specialize in news literacy education. I think that this problem of disinformation is largely because the demand side is not really well educated, so to speak. Now, no matter how much you try to be objective and fair, audience don't see you that way, right? If you're a public broadcaster or state-owned news media organizations, inevitably, some of the audience would say, well, you are paid by the government, you are paid by the state, therefore, you are biased, right? Even though if you look at the news report, it's not the case, audience don't see it that way. So it's the cognitive psychology um, among the news audience that's also affecting the trust. Now, trust is often mutually exclusive, and this was also in the Reuters report this morning. You say, no, no, we, we are really good, trust us. But that's exclusive, right? So if there are many audience who trust your news organizations, that means they are trusting your competitors less. So in other words, as a news industry as a whole, you are not really gaining more trust. Maybe more people are coming to your website or watch your news programs, but that, does, that also means that they are watching less, you know, or consuming less content from your competitors. So as a news industry as a whole, are you actually making anything better is a question mark, right? Um, <laughs> this is really sad. I used to be a journalist, and I get this all the time as well. Right? You report something, but audience doesn't remember where they get the news. Right? So for example, I heard something from my mother this morning. Right? My mom said, oh, this happened in Japan. When I retell the story to my friend, I already forgot where I heard it. Right? But I'm going to tell this to my friend. I said, oh, you know, I watched on NHK, this happened. So my mom got that information probably from social media, right? So I have two more minutes. I think I can finish, right? But when my mother told me, I don't know where she got it. And I forgot that I got it from my mom. So when I tell my friends, I said, oh, I heard from NHK this happened in Japan today, right? And I, I think most of you can relate to this, right? Oftentimes, people do not remember where they got news from. So that's a problem. Even if you are producing quality journalism, your audience might say, oh, yeah, I learned this from, then name your competitor. That could happen. <laughs> right. Uh, those of you, uh, those, those news audience who do not really trust you to begin with, it's extremely hard to gain their trust because, again, I don't have time to get into this, but asking somebody to trust you is asking somebody to take a risk. Right? And risk-taking is something that I 
talk quite a bit with my students. So if you have any questions, probably you can uh, grab me uh, over coffee after this presentation. So the worst of all, uh, research also showed show that um, people who are trying to manipulate the online public space, online conversations, the dialogues you have on, through social media, they are not just manipulating information. They are also manipulating trust. They know how to emotionally control people, at least on social media and the internet, right? Not everybody falls for that, but certain portion of the population fall for that, right? And they know how to do this. So in other words, trust is also being manipulated, right? So if you say, no, no, if people trust the traditional media more, quality journalism more, this disinformation uh, disorder problem will go away, is a bit naive um, assumption if you ask me. And I think that's pretty much it. Here's my contact. If you uh, want to discuss this with me, I'm always available tonight. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kajimoto. Asking someone to trust you is asking someone to take a risk. So that is certainly something to consider. Up next, we have Mr. John Neri, an opinion columnist at the Philippine Daily Enquirer, the largest newspaper in the Philippines. And he also served as a, a digital editor, uh, chief of this digital affiliate at uh, Enquirer.net prior, prior to that. And he is the incoming chair for the Bro Board of Trustee for the Asian Center for Journalism at the Ateneo de Manila University. Dr. Mr. John Neri, the floor is yours. Thank you. I like that you almost promoted me to a PhD. There is a crisis of disinformation in the Philippines. And we have seen and suffered its effects. But I think we are beginning to see the limits of this crisis of information too. Good afternoon. My name is John Neri. Uh, I was a long-time editor of the Philippine Daily Inquirer and for almost three years served as editor-in-chief of Inquirer.net. I have been writing an opinion column since, 20, since, since 2007 and I will be joining the board of the Asia Center for Journalism at the Ateneo de Limali University in a few weeks. I'm also a convener of the consortium on democracy and disinformation in the Philippines. It is these experiences, it is this background that allows me to raise the following four themes or ideas with you. The first of the four lessons from the Philippines is disinformation is old news. In fact, if you review the colonial history of the Philippines, a prominent Filipino writer once said, the Philippines spent 300 years in a Spanish convent and 50 years in Hollywood. And I think that pretty well sums it up. Just add three more years in a Japanese concentration camp. If you review this history, we will be reminded that, in fact, disinformation has been used as an instrument of colonization. Just two examples. Uh, in 1977, the esteemed scholar, Saeed Hussein Alatas, wrote the classic, The Myth of the Lazy Native, which was a powerful, which is a powerful critique against the use of other people of the idea that natives in Asia were naturally indolent. One of his touchstones was the Philippine hero, Jose Rizal, who in 1890 started a series of essays refuting the idea that the Filipino is indolent. Second example, in 1899, when U.S. President William McKinley 
decided to annex the Philippines, he rationalized his decision by saying, it is time to Christianize the Philippines. At the moment he said that, most of the population of about 6 million Filipinos were already Christian and Catholic. So, this information as a tool of colonization, subjugation, domination. This instrument took root in the Philippines because of what we can call the rich soil in the Philippines that allows this information to thrive. The first is that the Philippines is made up of many small affiliations, tribal, ethnic, regional, provincial, linguistic, religious. I can assure you that we all think as one, and yet I can also affirm that it is very easy to put one affiliation against another. The second side to this second lesson is that Philippine society is deeply unequal. There is a deep inequality that is economic, educational, occupational, name it. It is these two sides, these two factors that allow this information to take root in the Philippines. And these two factors have brought us to the present day. And the present day is a crisis of information. I would like to point to three aspects of this crisis. And the first, and I will not mince words, the President of the Philippines is a primary source of this information. Of many possible examples, let me just point to this. He once accused an opposition senator of possibly hoarding illegally uh, hidden wealth in offshore accounts. When that was conclusively proven not to be true, the president said, well, I just made it up. Right? And Verifiles, one of the three Philippine uh, news organizations accredited with the International Fact-Checking Network, reviewed its fact-checking uh, efforts in 2018 and came up with the realization that the president of the Philippines was the number one, one, was the number one source that needed to be fact-checked. This has implications for Philippine society. The second part of the third lesson is that there is what a landmark study calls an invisible machine of network disinformation working in the Philippines. You can all access this landmark study. It's called the Architects of Network Disinformation from Newton uh, for tech, dev com. This is one of its main conclusions. It found that this invisible machine in the Philippines consists of at least three paid layers. The first layer, that's where you have the architects of disinformation. They are the ones creating strategy. These are creative people in the advertising and PR industries. Below them, they work with the second layer of paid uh, cogs in the machine, and these are the influencers. And by influencer, the study defines it as having anywhere from 50,000 to 2 million followers on social media. And these people get the script from the top layer and spread it. And the third paid layer is the community level fake operator accounts. Now, you've probably heard that Facebook has wiped out hundreds of these accounts in the last few months. But for some time, they were very active. They are paid per piece or per week. Uh, and they bring out the, the script and translate it into their own language, into their own milieu. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the second part of the current reality in the Philippines. There is this invisible machine of network disinformation. The third part of the new normal is the disvaluing of information. When everything can be suspect, what do you make of the presidential spokesperson saying something like, the president does not lie? Now, even the president himself cheerfully admits he lies sometimes. He likes to do it. His most diehard supporters know 
see him as a strategic player using untruths to push for strategic objectives. For the presidential spokesperson to say, the president does not lie, is to say something that will not be believed by anyone, not even by the president's own supporters. This is what I mean when I say information has been disvalued. This is the new normal. Last two minutes. I spoke of beginning to see the limits of this culture of disinformation. Four possible factors. Number one, the social media influencers that the invisible machine used, their influence has waned considerably. Number two, Facebook and the other platforms, but especially Facebook, has engaged with concerned civil society and news organizations and have removed for coordinated inauthentic behavior hundreds of accounts of fake operator accounts. This is very important. For three years, people bought the myth that social media helped elect President Rodrigo Duterte. The numbers say that cannot be. Why? Because in 2016, only about 52% of the population was connected to the internet. And of, of that, maybe 50% were on social media. But we bought it. Why? Because the social media influencers went to town saying, we helped elect the new president. Even today, at 76% penetration rate, we're talking of 70 million people online. But we're also talking of more than 30 million Filipinos. That's more than the combined population of Australia and New Zealand who are not online. And lastly, we're beginning to see the seeds of resilience. I'm not talking about resistance, just sources of potential recovery after all this madness is done. Now, very, very quickly, there's more scholarship devoted to it. There's greater multi-sectoral cooperation, uh, universities, academes, civil society, uh, NGOs. The fact-checking workshops are small, but they are gaining in momentum and they are immediately empowering. There's more global and regional cooperation, and I look forward to tomorrow's meeting on disinformation. And last but not least, at least in the Philippines, now there is greater concern about getting lawmakers to pass a law penalizing fake news for all the wrong reasons. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for the enlightening uh, presentation. And how can we, for all of us who are in search of the truth, uh, fight the invisible machine of network disinformation that exists in many, many different countries, many, many different situations? Uh, up next, we have Ms. Chun Navi, who is the Deputy Director of Broadcasting De Department at the Ministry of Information in Cambodia. From 2014 to 2018, she was also the Deputy Chief of Bureau under the same department. She has completed her Bachelor in Law, has a Master's Degree in Public uh, Administration, and I have been told she is an avid learner of how to fight fake news. Ms. Navi, the floor is yours. My higher respect to Excellency, Madam, ladies and gentlemen, and honorable guests in this event today. Uh, as our moderator already introduced. So first of all, I would like to show you the overview of the social media in Cambodia. There are 396 websites and TV online are registered at the Ministry of Information. As, Mr. As our moderator has raised, that there are a huge number of social media in and Cambodia also the, the one of the most social media. And I would like to show you the popular social media in Cambodia. Now we have Facebook, YouTube, Telegram, WhatsApp, Instagram, Line, Twitter, and the most popular is Facebook. Many, they are, according to the telecommunication regulator of Cambodia, there are over 19 million mobile phone number at, um, 
uh, it is was 117 percent compared to the total population which are over 16 million and there are 82.61 mobile broadband compared to the total population also with the six mobile internet service provider with a very suitable price that's all people can connect to the internet and they use the social media so social media in Cambodia are very wide according to the TOC also there are seven over seven million Facebook account in Cambodia they are fake news, disinformation, and misinformation. They are siblings, so they always come together. Just part of, part of fake news, they from the misinformation, or sometimes they from the uh, disinformation. And most of fake news are from the fake account or fake page. And all of them are doing, uh, sharing or posting the fake information or disinformation to attract the audience for the, their business reason. Sometimes all fake, fake news are from the anonymous account or the opposite political party. And they are posting or sharing fake news because of they want to fight or they want to discredit for the any uh, popularity of the party. And also sometimes they have come from the press unit themselves why I, I say that the fake news come from the press unit not mean that they are intend to spread the fake news, but they just misinformation because sometimes as uh, Anne has raised yesterday in the pre workshop of this information, they are the one they the one they are you need to be the first report for this content. So they they didn't I'm sorry. So they didn't verify from the all sources. That's why they posting and then uh, they, they got the misinformation. But in Cambodia, we, we have a press law with a, uh, the unique article that we have no censorship. But if the press, the, the press unit posting or public or the wrong article, they can correct it. So let me show you how fake news has affected us. Many, many things or many points, many problems that coming from the fake news. But the biggest problem is fake news lead us to the wrong decision. So if we get the wrong decision, everything is wrong. So just want to point out that Everybody has freedom of expression, but your expression must not attack the other. That's why we have the measure or legal mechanism to control the one who spread the fake news. Now in Cambodia, we have inter-ministerial proclamation, uh, which is we collaborate the Ministry of Interior and Ministry of Telecommunication Post. And we have law on press, as I mentioned recently. Also, we have criminal code and feedback. Let me tell you why we, we have this to control the fake news. Even if we cannot control all 100%, but in fact, they are part of the, our mechanism. The inter-ministerial proclamation on the management on dissemination through website and social media network operating on the internet in the Kingdom of Cambodia, which you can see here. One of the article in this proclamation, they aim to manage and control all information content or message in the form of text or your picture, video, and or any other form on web network on the internet in the kingdom of Cambodia so by this mechanism we can control we, uh, fake news or this information in Cambodia are reused 
and according to this proclamation, we collaborate with the, our partner uh, to take action on the blocking website and the social network that launch illegal commercial activity and all deliberate dissemination of information. Actually, we we also we used to collaborate with uh, Facebook. Uh, maybe uh, recent, recently, in 2018, they hacked, someone hacked the uh, TVK, the, our national broadcasting, TVK Facebook. So we work with uh, our party and send the letter direct to the Facebook. And recently, they are so we can take the, our pack back. For the press law, as I mentioned recently, the press law is we have unique article that there are no censorship for the publishing. But if someone or any person believes that there are any article, whether writing, letting, letting picture, or they can complain to their uh, to their press unit to correct or to edit their content. Also, the criminal code. If you use your expression to offend or to, to defend or to attack somebody, you will challenge with the criminal code. So the feedback, now we are all uh, institution or the ministry, they are creating the media, social, social media such as Facebook page, website, or YouTube channel to get the comment or feedback from the audience or from the public yes. and all the public can all the public can comment and uh, so they are concerned to the government so the government will get back and mostly all the problem are so actually the ministry of information also have the material board like us now we have an information app so you can download from the app store or play store to combat fake news you must use the reliable news and trust you to find the reason start from us thank you thank you very much Ms. John. Ms. John gave us a lot of examples on the legal measures on uh, how Cambodia is trying to address the issue of disinformation. Uh, of course, uh, with any measures, there needs to be um, a series of feedback, which they have, and um, a mechanism in which to ensure that whatever actions that we take, in the end, it's for the uh, improvement of the flow of information, quality news, and of course, to fight malicious and harmful spread of disinformation. Up next is our speaker, Mr. Roland Usson, who is based in Malaysia at the uh, French Embassy. He is the Councillor for Cooperation and Cultural Affairs. He served previously as the head of public service broadcasting under the French Ministry for Culture and Communication. From 2010 to 2014, he served as the Deputy Director for Audiovisual Policy, as well as the Director for European and International Affairs at the French National Center for Cinema and Motion Pictures. A man of many talents, Mr. Husson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Good afternoon. Um, so my name is Roland. I've been uh, working for the French Ministry of Communication for 15 years and uh, also for the European Commission on uh, media policies. So I guess that's why I've been asked to uh, give an overview of the European perspective on disinformation in 10 minutes. So it's a challenge, uh, giving an overview of the legal framework and also of the current uh, debates and legislative changes in Europe. So the European perspective on Europe. I won't talk about the situation in Asia. I leave this for the discussion. Uh, and I'm a diplomat. So uh, I just want to stress that this is my 
personal views. Um, so, starting with the legal framework uh, in Europe, uh, just a quick reminder, uh, as it was said before, this information is not new. Uh, I took example from the 19th century, manipulation of newspapers, maybe some of you uh, know the story of the end dispatch, which triggered uh, the German-French War of uh, 1870, because newspapers manipulation, or manipulation of image, which is very relevant on social media, but it existed before internet. Uh, in Romania in 1989, when there was the revolution, uh, there was uh, so-called massive killings in Timisoara, and uh, one year after, we discovered that it was wrong. It was all fake news. So, as we've been dealing with disinformation for uh, years or centuries, in fact, we have media laws and freedom of expression laws in Europe for many years, and even before the European construction started in 1957. So that's why, basically, in Europe, freedom of expression laws and media laws are of the competence of the member states, and we have shared competence with the European Union as regards broadcasting and electronic communication. And this is very important for the current debate in Europe. So when we say that we have had media laws and freedom of expression laws for a very long time, I will take the example of France. So we have a law on freedom of press, which is in fact a law on freedom of expression, because it's used also for freedom of speech, since 1881, so for a very long time. And it hasn't been changed very much for the last uh, more than one century. Um, it's uh, very important to remind that this law hasn't been changed so much, and it has been applied to all the technological changes, meaning that it was used for the freedom of speech, for the freedom of printed press, but also for uh, radio, television, and now since uh, the uh, uh, for the last 20 years on the internet. So, we have a, what we can call an anti-fake news law since 1881, and actually we haven't changed it for the internet. So you have the definition of uh, what is wrong information, which is since 1881 uh, uh, an offense, and you can be condemned for this, and there was no need of changing uh, this law. What is important to have in mind is first that the intention in the definition, the intention of spreading wrong information is very important and the judge, which is independent from the government, must prove that there was, the, the information was wrong and there was the intention of spreading the information. So that's the legal framework that we are using in France. Actually, I took a, uh, in a, a report of the European Commission the definition that they are using. It's actually quite the same. So I would say that in Europe we have these definitions and we have a kind of robust legal framework dealing with disinformation. So, if we have been dealing with disinformation for a long time, and if we have good laws, of, we, are, we are happy with these laws, why should we change? And then the big question is not the media law, is the enforcement. And why? But you know this, because with internet and social media, the scale, the speed, and the precision of targeting of disinformation has completely changed. So, in the last few years, I would say at least since 2015, there is a growing awareness of the problems of disinformation in Europe. Um, in 2015, that was the first action taken, there was a, a so-called East Stratcom Task Force created to fight against the disinformation campaign coming from Russia. And with the Brexit campaign, the, election, uh, the US election in 2016, and even the French election in there is this growing awareness that action must be taken. Uh, I, I take this example 
uh, for uh, the election of President Macron in uh, 2017, a few days before the vote, there was an information spreading on the social media about Macron being engaged in tax evasion uh, in the Bahamas and the, uh, it was actually totally fake uh, and the, the traditional media in uh, a few days they, they could prove that uh, the information was fake but, uh, and it didn't change the result of the elections but it was really a tentative of manipulation just before the vote. So uh, this is very concerning for us, obviously. And what is interesting in this case is that apparently this manipulation came first from the US and was spread on the internet by Russian accounts. So that's what was uh, uh, the information which was given by, by the press la later. So action must be taken. Uh, so in, in the last two years, there's been a lot of work in Europe. So you can refer to this report of the European Commission, this communication on tackling online disinformation, uh, European approach. I think in this you will have all the information. And one thing which is very important is the protection of the electoral process. And uh, that's something which is underlined in the report of the uh, uh, European Commission. And France has taken measure. Uh, we passed a law in uh, December last year. And I want to insist on one very important thing. It's not one new anti-fake news law. As I said before, we had and we still have our anti-fake news law since 1881. So we didn't need to change. And uh, in Malaysia last year or in Singapore this year, when they are passing anti-fake news law, they are saying, look, the French are doing the same. Not at all. What we are doing is just we are adapting specific measure of enforcement of the law that existed before. So we are not changing the rules on freedom of expression or freedom of press. We are just trying to have more transparency on internet and the social media to make sure that we can apply the existing law. So that's the same conclusion of the European Commission. We must have regulation of internet platforms if we want to make sure that we can control the spread of disinformation. The European Commission said that so far the online, online platforms have not been very good at giving transparency and information about the use of uh, the networks. So for the moment, at the level of the European Commission, they are trying to have a kind of self-regulation with a code of practice which has been signed by the biggest platform like uh, YouTube and Facebook. And because this issue of regulating the internet platform is very controversial in Europe, I put on this slide the fact that, in fact, the regulation that we had was adopted between 2000 and 2002. And it was at a time before the creation of YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all the social media. And in this regulation, we have a category of hosting platforms with no accountability, no responsibility. And this platform, for the last 18 years, they have, saying, they have been saying, OK, we are, we are hosting platforms, so we, we are not accountable for the content on the platform. And now, I think that it's changing. So in the last few years, we had the uh, uh, General Data Protection Regulation, which has been passed in uh, uh, 2016. Recently, the Copyright Directive, which has been passed uh, also by the uh, European Union, which is a, a start of regulation of the uh, internet platforms. So that's what could be done if we want to go for a regulation of the internet platforms. And uh, my guess that in, uh, and I'm coming to my conclusion because time has gone, uh, in the near future we will have this kind of uh, regulation needed in, uh, in Europe. So my conclusion is, one, we should refrain from changing uh, freedom of expression uh, laws, media laws, because that's not the third subject. If we had good laws for press, or television before, we must keep them. We shouldn't have specific laws for news on the internet. 
But what we need is a democratic regulation of internet platform to give more transparency, to enable the citizens to use their critical thinking. Because if they don't have the information about what's going on on the internet platforms, they can't use their, internet, uh, their critical thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Houston. One thing that I take away from uh, his presentation was the need for transparency. Regardless of the mechanism that is going to be put in place, whether at the newsroom level, whether it is at an individual blogger level, or whether it is at a national legal uh, level, it requires a large, strong, open, transparent process. And that is something that I think is missing in a lot of processes that try to deal with how to fight this information. You cannot fight this information with more secrecy. That is only going to strengthen this information. And as I have said, to round things off, we have uh, Miss Anne Kruger, who is uh, from Australia currently. And she is the person who is behind First Draft Asia Pacific. First Draft is a fact-checking organization, and she has also been involved with Crosscheck Australia for the 2019 federal election that just recently concluded in the country, and has spent most of her career working in Asia, including as an international journalist and anchor at CNN International Hong Kong, Bloomberg TV, TV uh, uh, Radio Television Hong Kong, as well as Radio Corporation Singapore. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much, Ming Kwok, distinguished guests. It's wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to start to hear the discussion today. Turn around to what is the role of journalists? And I want to turn that even more, and I want to, you to focus your concentration on what journalists do. As Ming Kwok said in the introduction, I'm working for First Draft. Now, First Draft is a not-for-profit organisation that aims to support journalists, academics, and technologists. And we've heard from all of those groups here today. And we support them as they work towards figuring out trust and truth and the issues related to them in this digital world that we live in. Now, there's many initiatives that First Draft uses. One of them is this cross-check platform, and in fact, one of its most early and successful versions of cross-check was for the French elections that we've heard a little bit about today as well. How cross-check works is, it's like a meeting of the minds. We know that two is better than one. Many hands makes like work. So what happens is we gather media companies that are used to actually competing with each other, we gather them together and we get them to monitor and to work together and to use open source verification tools to look at the issues that are happening online and the potential problems. And through the Crosscheck platform, there have been stories that have been told, there have been debunks that have been delivered that otherwise would not have got out there to the mainstream. But all of the people who join, and this is where the trust comes in, all of the people who want to join up on a cross-check platform have to sign and understand the guiding principles behind it. Basically, that puts into practice best editorial policies and also things like making sure that we actually don't do more harm. Sometimes when you're going to report on an issue, some misinformation or disinformation, there's this tipping point where you can actually make it worse. And it's quite complex how we delve through that process. So today, I want to turn your focus to journalists. And I want to ask you to trust journalists. And I want you to actually see what can be done when we look back at the role of journalists. Now, I know when I started out in journalism, and I've been fortunate to work with wonderful journalists throughout my career, and I've always chosen to work for uh, quality organisations, and I know the journalists that I have taught at universities in the past, 
always have these noble ideals that they are wanting to deliver information that is going to help society. Never have I met a journalist that says, I'm getting into this because I want to produce clickbait. Never. So let's get back to what is the role of a journalist. What are they wanting to do? Why aren't we focusing more on supporting that? Also, the other thing today I want to do is to change the discussion. I don't want you to be talking about fake news anymore. I don't want to hear fake news. We need to clarify this. And we've touched on this a little bit earlier. We need to clarify what are we talking about. We need to be clear. We need our journalists and we need the children in school who are being taught media literacy. We need the whole industry coming together and understanding, well, is this something satirical, reflecting on society? Or is this something that is going to um, mislead people? When I'm scrolling through my Facebook feed or when I'm getting a message on WhatsApp, I have to think, is this possibly because some imposter here? Is this something that is just completely 100% fabricated? I need people to be starting to think critically about these possibilities, these motivations that we've heard about today. A headline, I'm not going to click on that headline because it's pretty obvious the way that's worded, that's not going to deliver anything for me. Is the context clear? Or is there something more that could be added to this? Some, you know, starting to think a little bit more critically about the bigger situation. Or if I look at that picture, it just looks too good to be true. It usually absolutely is. Has something just been photoshopped and cut and paste? So through the Crosscheck platform, we were able to monitor the Australian elections and I've started to write a couple of articles about some of the themes that we saw there. And I was surprised at some of the themes that came out. Um, and I've written about those on our first draft website. So we debunked things. So this is a very colloquial um, Facebook far-right group that um, was trying to spread misinformation about immigration issues in Australia. Now, with the workshop that I held yesterday, I would hope that everyone in that room would now have the tools to be able to debunk this in probably 20 seconds. It's simple, misleading, false context. So that photo that's been manipulated and is actually a story from 2015. Headlines can be hacked. Some will charge you money. There are some ways you can do it for free. We need to know that this is what happens so that as soon as we see something like this on Twitter, I think it's getting into that category there. There's some imposter content here. Something's been fabricated. Just because this is a Twitter handle that says it's the name of the opposition leader and it has a blue tick, that doesn't mean it's okay. And in fact, this wasn't even a tweet. That um, Twitter handle is not the real Bill Shorten. We work this And the actual interface isn't even a um, Twitter interface. This was something that was designed to be uh, manipulated and just put on Facebook. There is a Bill Shorten, that particular Bill Shorten handle that exists on Twitter, but it's been taken down. And we have the tools to see, we can see the exact dates taken down. These are the tools that the journalists are trained in through Crosscheck that they can gather together. That happens to be the real Bill Shorten um, Twitter account. Seriously took us about five seconds to work out the main steps there. False context and manipulated content. Now this was another meme that was going around in the Australian elections again, anti-immigration, anti-Muslim. Um, a particular uh, worrisome far-right senator who was using memes like this to try to spread racism and hate. Now with this one, we use our skills and we see actually verification is a bit of a process. That photo was actually taken of three completely different situations in time, again from years ago, and I've left the small print quite small and the last picture quite small and cut off there because some of it's actually quite unpleasant. But the final picture actually comes from 20 years ago and has nothing to do with what that meme was talking about. So societies are more divided than ever. And when you get into social media, it's like everyone gets on steroids and everyone has their different motivations and their different purposes for what they want with this information. 
I liken it a little bit sometimes too to when we're driving a car. Sometimes you might sort of toot the person near you or you might be complaining about them. But if that person was standing right next to you, we wouldn't do that. We don't, that's not how we treat each other. So why are we treating each other like that online? So we find that elections, but not only elections, other issues as well, like health, vaccines, um, food. These are the things where people try to sow division and take advantage of different responses. So collaboration, journalists working together, We've had great success in the um, project over the Australian election. SBS was one of the main companies that worked with us. And we debunked another one of these memes from that same um, candidate. And I've put the arrow in there that um, this candidate actually tried to take and hide this meme from the Facebook page. But we have the tools to show it was there. We can hold them accountable. They can't just take something off and say, oh no, it doesn't exist. We can show, no, actually you did have that there. And in New Zealand, they're working together and collaborating there in how they're covering the trial, of the, the trial of the mosque shooter. We've seen that this works because the media there, or most of the media there, a lot of the large media companies, signed a statement to say that during this trial they will make sure that that shooter does not gain any more of a platform for his extremist views. So part of being responsible and earning the trust as journalists is making sure that we're not a part of the problem and we're not amplifying these issues. So that's why we have this um, trumpet, if you like, of, and we don't want to be megaphones. So things might be circular, circulating around in the anonymous web. There are particular hand signs and symbols that otherwise would be shown in the New Zealand media as that trial was progressing. But the New Zealand media is blocking that out. And so I'm not used to seeing them now, and I'm used to seeing things blurred out. And then occasionally I'll look into some international press or news organisations that aren't following this code, and I see those symbols, I think, oh, they're amplifying it. So these are ethical discussions as well. It's amazing the things that we can find, and the amazing the um, things that journalists can do when we're all working together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, which brings us to the fact that in this day and age, all of us, not just practicing journalists, but editors, producers, press units in the ministries, regulators who need to look at information, and any one of us that literally just deals with the digital uh, environment must have a set of tools ready at our disposal at the tip of our fingers to be able to verify, fact check at a very basic level as part of our daily skills. And that is certainly something that we would like to see happening more and more. And with that, we would like to invite again all our speakers to join us for a round of Q&A with the members of the audience. We would like to, first of all, uh, open up the floor for any potential questions. We will take a round of questions uh, and then we will go for another round if we have time. The first gentleman on the, our left, please. Please uh, state your name, your affiliation, and if it's a question, please make sure your question is direct. I would kindly ask not to have any opinions. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. I have a question for all the speakers, but especially for Mr. Roland. Uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Alex. I'm representing Russian news ag agency called Sputnik, which is the biggest uh, news agency of Russia. And uh, uh, well, we often claim to be fake news agency by French authorities, to be true. Uh, but it's not the case I want to discuss here. Uh, my question is, no, do you think sometimes uh, this term fake news is actually misused to just cover or block some different opinions? And where is the borderline between the fake news, different opinion, and who's supposed to set this borderline? Is this the common sense of the people to decide which is the truth? Or is it government supposed to put this borderline? Thank you. 
Excellent question, which I think links to exactly what Anne was talking about in his last presentation about the nuances and different types of misinformation, disinformation, and even malinformation. Uh, the question was directed to all, but uh, perhaps both Anne and Roland could uh, start with the replies. Thanks for the question. Um, well, uh, it's not up to the government or any uh, public institution to decide whether it is right or wrong, true or, or not. Uh, news must be uh, verifiable. Uh, if it is and if the facts are, are true, it's true. And uh, in the legislations I, I was talking about, uh, it's exactly what's uh, in question. And the, the judge must prove that the information is uh, wrong. Um, and uh, in the recent legislation that we, we passed in France, one of the criteria for uh, the judge to decide to uh, stop the spread of uh, uh, news on social media is the fact that we can prove that uh, the spread is artificial, meaning that uh, bots fake accounts are used. So um, it's not a question of deciding if something is uh, right or wrong. It's based on facts. If you can uh, prove, like it was the case, I, I took the example of uh, uh, Macron during the elections. Uh, the tax evasion, he was accused of. There was a document with the signature, and he, it took just uh, a few hours for a, a journalist to check that uh, the writing, the signature, and the document was totally fake. So this is a fact. And then you can report that it's uh, not true that uh, uh, Macron is uh, engaged in a tax evasion, at least in this case. And uh, you can also prove that this information has been spread uh, artificially using fake accounts and uh, bots. So I think that's very important that uh, the action which is taken is based on this kind of facts and that's the case in France and not on a decision of a judge or an administration on what is true or not true. And? And I think that's where we have this catch-all phrase that's a big problem where we say fake news because we're actually talking here about clarifying what are we talking about because the term fake news can be used by people just as a throwaway line and as we have heard it can just refer to things that well people disagree with so oh it's fake news but we need to be specific. We say, well, this is imposter content or something has been fabricated or there is a grain of truth, there is this kernel of truth and this is one detail but this is how people have taken one detail and manipulated it. We had a few examples of that in the Australian elections where there was misinformation going around about an inheritance tax, a, a death tax and there was a grain of truth that came out from 2006 where the opposition treasurer wrote a paper when he was an economics professor about the merits of inheritance taxes and death taxes. And most economists will actually say, in theory, it sounds good, but they'll all also admit that it's also in practice political suicide, and particularly in Australia, no one wants to hear it. But he did write that paper in 2006 but in his current position, Labor came out, they said absolutely, you know, that was a theory, yes, that he wrote when he was a professor, but it's not a Labor policy. However, that got wings and it spread throughout the entire election campaign and to this day people will still think that, oh, this, this is a policy that they had. But we've actually tracked back and we've seen that this started in Facebook Messenger and that's been copied and pasted and we've seen who's been spreading that. Um, we know the exact electorate where it began in Australia and the people who were spreading that and they were from um, the li they were Liberal Party supporters. So um, we can actually um, see what happens here with misleading content. 
rather than just go, oh, that's fake news. We need to be really clear. And when you talk about Russia, so Russia often gets blamed for being trolled. Um, that's another thing, I, you know, I think we have to be careful about too. You obviously have your, your proof, and it's hard work finding that truth um, and finding the proof, and that has been done, and we need to show that we document this um, in all of our reports, and this is what responsible journalism does. It will document things, because that's going to be another one that I think we um, have to be careful about. Otherwise, we just go, oh, it's, trace it back to Russia. You know, it, that's, that's as bad as us saying, oh, it's fake news. No, we have to actually show, um, like what has been done, um, you know, I'm not saying that hasn't been, but um, we have to show that these are the steps. And this is why journalism is just so time consuming and difficult and technical, and we need to get that trust back um, to the role of what journalists are doing, and we just need so much more support, because that takes time. Other speakers? Masato, Navi. <laughs> okay, uh, excellent answers from two of our speakers. Any other questions regarding this topic? Which is uh, picking up on uh, Anne's point. Picking up on Anne's point, uh, it's quite interesting because it's true that fact checking, good journalism takes time, take money, but the fact is that time and money are both in short demand, short supply nowadays. <laughs> The gentleman uh, with the microphone, uh, please state your name, your affiliation, and please be precise with your questions. Hi, um, my name is Sobat. I work for Voice of America, Mayor Service. Uh, I had a question related to the, what the gentleman was asking. Um, I think for real fake news, it's easier to, to identify, um, but uh, I think in, it was very helpful to see the list of uh, the, the metrics of disinformation, uh, misinformation as well, disinformation. My question in the context of uh, Asia Pacific especially is, uh, and I think for, for all of you who are experts, where does propaganda lie into this spectrum? Um, as uh, many of the countries in Asia are rushing to um, enact fake news laws, um, many of the countries are also um, quite restricted in their media environment. So in that context, should propaganda be regulated as well? And I, th and I think it might be interesting from um, the, the French expert to see how, how that is seen differently in Europe versus in Asia in terms of the, the laws to regulate fake news or some kind of news that, you know, that's where you can verify the truth. Thank you so very much. Um, laws to regulate propaganda. <laughs> what does the professor say? Well, um, so going back to taxonomy of misinformation, it's really important to define what information we are talking about, right? First draft has seven types of misinformation. Uh, EABI, European Association of Viewers Interest, they have 10 types. So if you look for the internet, there are many efforts in our field to define specifically what we are talking about. And if you look at those definitions uh, of propaganda, there are several traits of propaganda. Number one, the purpose is to gain mass support, right? So propaganda doesn't really if you think about North Korea, it's a really easy example of propaganda. They don't care what is true or not. Right? So their idea of sending propaganda is to gain mass support. Everybody has to support the government, therefore they are disseminating that particular information. So if you look, at, there are specific um, definitions of propaganda. Now, should propaganda be regulated? I'm against it. If you believe in free speech, fake news shouldn't be regulated. Uh, for the same reason, propaganda shouldn't be regulated. But there are, of course, exceptions, right? There, somebody has to draw the line somewhere. For example, child pornography, as a society, we think that that's the kind of content we should ban, right? That has to be regulated. So there are certain areas of information that we could all agree that we should ban, right? Propaganda, fake news, if it's absolutely sinister, it instigates uh, violence, maybe, right? So that's why I think French and Germany, those countries, they have several steps to go through to prove, right? 
that it has a real social impact. In Asia Pacific, the problem is oftentimes it's the government who decides, not the court, right? Um, that, that's very problematic, especially in Singapore, for example, right? Government ministers can choose initially, right? And then they will discuss later in the court. That's not the system we want. It has to be the opposite, right? Um, I don't know what I'm talking about here. No, uh, you, you make complete <laughs> right. sense because propaganda, again, is a very broad term. Right. And to understand what exactly that we do not want to see as an outcome of propaganda being used on the public is to understand what exact harm is that specific propaganda doing and address that specific harm rather than a blanket term of uh, uh, banning propaganda which can be equated to banning fake news. How does that even work, right? So, uh, yes, John. Maybe John first? Um, I don't think that propaganda by itself is necessarily disinformation. Uh, based on the earlier work of First Draft, uh, the book Information Disorder uh, talks about really just basic, three basic types of, uh, uh, of uh, wrong information. So misinformation, uh, they define, uh, Claire Wardell and... Uh, um, Hossein Derekson, uh, define as the use of uh, real information, uh, I'm sorry, the use of uh, uh, wrong information, but without an intent to harm. There is no intent to harm. It, it just happens. It's a, it's a mistake. Uh, this information is defined as information that is fabricated in order to cause harm. And malinformation is information that happens to be real, but is moved to the public space in order to cause harm. For instance, private data, which is real, moved to the uh, public in order to make, to, to make harassment for someone possible. So the question is, is the propaganda that we're talking about disinformation, malinformation, or misinformation? If it is none of those things, and I am sanguine enough to accept the possibility that there is propaganda that will not fall under any of those three, then there, there should be no problem. So I think that propaganda here might be a red herring. Uh, I apologize for that, for my westernized education. I, I don't have an Asian uh, equivalent for that. Uh, it's like a false lead. Uh, when in fact we should just concentrate on misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Thank you so much, John. Yes, uh, Roland. Um, well, uh, I agree with my, my colleagues uh, because, you know, we, we need different opinions in a, a democratic debate. It's very important. So, um, but if by propaganda you mean the uh, uh, influence by the government, if I can give uh, uh, examples of regulations in, uh, in France. In France, first, um, it's very different compared with the U.S. Um, advertising, uh, political advertising is forbidden. So you can't pay for uh, advertising for uh, politics on TV, newspapers, and uh, the idea is that you must have a level playing field for uh, parties with, political parties with a lot of money, the government and parties with no money. That's the first thing. And the other thing is we have what we call the reserve electoral, the electoral reserve, which means that during the electoral campaigns, the civil servants uh, must refrain from uh, talking publicly about the action of the government, not to give any support to uh, the government in view of the uh, elections. So that's a kind of regulation of what you could call uh, propaganda. Okay. Is there another question from the floor? Yes, sir. Um, thank you for your opportunity. <coughs> I think we also should... Uh, may I ask for oh, your name and your My name is Zulgai Menashtion from University of Indonesia in Jakarta. Uh, <coughs> I'd like to add to those things that uh, were uh, related or associated with this, uh, this information. Uh, what I mean is, what about lies? lies? Uh, it's, it's happened that uh, for example, when 
in a, in a, uh, in a place uh, they, there was a, a, a lack of water for example and then one of the uh, official uh, of government official would say that there is enough water uh, is that also uh, uh, part of the disinformation or uh, fake news uh, I think it's happened you know about this uh, this uh, kind of uh, I don't know maybe the government has the reason to to, to keep the uh, people calm but I think it still lies thank you well um, I thank you so much for the question uh, this again links to how we understand the categories and the nuances of information being circulated uh, regardless of the media, whether it's official traditional legacy media or whether it is an application on your smartphone, um, the types of information that is being flown around, which I guess is the reason why media information literacy skills uh, are so very important, because we cannot stop uh, information from being abused, whether it is with bad intention or whether it is by pure accident that my ADO aunt has forwarded me a message from WhatsApp which is clearly not true but I'm not going to accuse my ADO aunt of spreading disinformation it's probably a genuine case of misinformation in that case but uh, perhaps this is to bring that around the question could be uh, forwarded to the speakers in the sense that we are trying to make certain regulations or certain uh, policy changes, whether in the newsroom, whether in uh, national authority, whether it's with a regulator. So when we are formulating policies and guidelines, what kind of uh, items and things should we keep in mind when we are formulating guidelines to deal with disinformation from your perspective? I, I suggest if you want to formulate policies, I would suggest, and we've had discussions over this before and I've worked with UNESCO before, I would suggest mandating, and I've said this before, media literacy programs in school, um, but have outside experts that are teaching it and keeping that content updated so that that doesn't turn into a propaganda. Um, and to the question before, um, from the gentleman from Indonesia, that's also the role of journalists. So there's two things there. So you've got your media literacy, and that tells you that, okay, this is the government. It's their job. We know that's their motivation. They want to keep the calm. They want to, you know, have a positive um, perspective that they keep about themselves. We need to just understand that maybe they're not necessarily trying to be malicious, but that is their role and we need to understand that. And kids in school can understand that. And then we need to support journalists to be able to go, thank you for that, Minister, but I've actually just got some first-hand information here that shows otherwise, so can you please answer that or please go and correct this situation? So we need the two working together in practice. Um, if uh, um, I were to recommend one uh, program or policy, I, it, it would be uh, to foster programs on critical thinking. So whether it's part of uh, a media and information literacy campaign or uh, outside of that uh, altogether, I think that it is uh, important for us to understand exactly how our mind works, uh, which, is, which helps us explain why what was it again, Masato? Uh, uh, false, uh, sorry, you, you said it, uh, uh, Dr. Lim. Uh, the um, uh, fake, uh, false f information travels six times faster than uh, real news. And there's a reason for that. It's the way our minds are structured. So if we can learn more about cognitive biases, for instance, confirmation bias, uh, recency effect, and so on and so forth, uh, I have been in a couple of these workshops, and I've conducted a couple of these workshops, and I, and I have to say it's... It's, it's, uh, it's very useful. Uh, people uh, get in, excited about the idea that 
they are understanding the structure of the way their minds work, and that might help us uh, going forward. Okay, for me, I think education is the most important. So I totally agree with uh, Anne. So we can put uh, it in the uh, program, study program. And I think that the one thing uh, we, we could that everything must be professional, not just hear from someone to someone and then say it. So the main role from the to to control or to manage the fake news, maybe the journalists. Yes, if they are all the professional journalists, so fake news will be reduced uh, uh, and maybe disappear. Yes. Well, I, I'd like to uh, correct one misinformation uh, because this study has been mentioned several times today. The lies travel six times faster than the real news story. That's a very simplified understanding of the particular study, right? That study looked at only a few news items on Twitter, specifically in the US market. And also they're comparing, yes, it's not international, and also it's comparing the particular fake news stories, how many times it was been tweeted, versus news stories that are correcting that and how that travels. So they are not measuring the actual news stories on that particular topic, how many news organizations produce that and how many people actually share that. That's not part of the study. So it's really not, the study did not really say lies travel six times faster than real news stories. It's slightly different and you can check that on the internet, right? And having said that, I agree with my colleagues here. Uh, Education is very important. Um, me and some of the like-minded educators, we are now advocating for teaching media literacy and news literacy skills to future public school teachers. We are not aiming at students. We are aiming at teachers who, have to, who will be certified to teach something in public schools. It doesn't matter if you're a history teacher, mathematics teacher, you have to go through media literacy trainings when you become a teacher. And uh, we think that's more effective because then you can really target different types of misinformation, right? If it's a revisionism in history, it's much better history teachers understand what's going on on the internet. And with that idea, you teach history, right? If it's about uh, manipulation of statistics by the government, it's the mathematics teacher who can teach that best in school. So that's what we are advocating, te educating the teachers first. They should be media literate no matter what. And third thing I want to say is transparency. Government can withhold certain information for the safe public safety. For example, we had massive tsunami and nuclear crisis in Japan in 2011. And at the time, many people are suspecting that government is actually hiding information about radiation level, right? And, well, you can argue with me, but I think I trust my Japanese government enough to say that they disclosed everything towards the end, not immediately. They had this concern, right? Well, we don't want to cause public panic, and that was a mistake. They, if they had released all the information transparently from the beginning, yes, you couldn't really completely kill the people who are sort of doubting the government. I believe in free speech. If you believe in free speech, you should allow people to lie or be cynic, right? And that's part of the deal. Um, but having said that, if you're transparent enough, then there are probably enough number of people who could see through that and understand why you know, government is taking that position, if that makes any sense. Well, obviously education is very important. Uh, and I think one more thing is to always keep in mind that freedom of expression is the most important. And uh, to refrain from uh, having broad responses with uh, side effects limiting freedom of expression. Uh, so uh, that's why I insisted in my presentation on the fact that we, if we have good laws for freedom of expression, we should keep them and just have targeted responses on the regulation of how social media and internet is, uh, is working. Well, I think that wraps up quite nicely our discussion for today. We talked about what can be considered as 
let's call it the F word. <laughs> what can be considered the F word? Uh, how do we recognize it? And we end with steps and certain recommendations, more education, media, media literacy programs, critical thinking, uh, transparency and understanding uh, the correct and reaching out to the different uh, target group, not just students, but also the teachers that can influence the students and teach students a little bit uh, more detail in their respective areas of competency. So I think that sums up quite very, very nicely the topic of our discussion today, disinformation and new media. And once again, I would like to thank and I would like to welcome, uh, ask all of us to give a round of applause to our speakers.